A few of us who have spent the last 30 to 50 years of our professional career running around the world, trying to improve laws, regulations, methods, and techniques for the protection and conservation of natural and cultural heritage properties, notably through promoting the adherence to the 1972 World Heritage Convention, were joined by younger generations of heritage experts and activists to do something more because we felt that much, much more had to be done to stop the increasing destruction of our heritage assets and values. And because the scope and extent of the problem requires civil society intervention and action, first by breaking the monopoly by governments to control the implementation of the World Heritage Convention. To be sure, it is not to reduce the role of governments in protecting and conserving heritage. Quite on the contrary, the aim is for civil society, i.e. citizens, to pressure governments to be more accountable and for citizens to push companies to stop activities that harm our commons, our collective assets. And of course, to promote among ourselves ways and means to be more respectful and caring of our own heritage as well as those of others. So during the first COVID breakdown, uh, lockdown, when we couldn't travel anymore, <laughs> Our thoughts matured through greater context with each other across generations and across continents. And within a few months, the initi initiative took shape. We are still small with only some 300 members to date, but by tabling issues through the preparations of the 2021 debates, more and more people began to join our reflections. We are convinced that our world heritage will become a basis for action and we hope that thousands and hundreds of thousands and soon millions will join us. <laughs> Starting the 2021 debate on the theme of transformational impacts on information technology gave a great boost to our World Heritage Initiative. As its 24 hour Globinar in not a marathon, but sprinter series of some 25 events with over 150 speakers, panelists, modelists, moderators and reporters, reporters reached an audience of over 900 people from across the world. So next in line is, are the debates on tourism. The point is not to keep on repeating its negative impact on heritage, the environment, and on some of the local inhabitants and their values, but to highlight on the contrary, how it could be positive and to improve things in a very practical way. Those of us fortunate enough to live in relative safety with access to food, clean water, housing, healthcare, and education for our loved ones, all dream of traveling to beautiful places and to learn from the way of life of others, whether within our own country or in distant places. So this program on tourism we offer you is composed of a series of 21 events taking place from today, the 1st of February to the 26th of February, almost every day from Monday to Saturday, and even one event on Sunday, <laughs> uh, with each event being between one to two, two and a half hours duration. Many of you may not be able to take time off from your work days, but we hope that conditions of teleworking from home through flexible working hours will enable you to reflect on what policies, programs, and actions that governments, local authorities, UN agencies, universities, schools, NGOs, and individuals can adopt so that tourism can contribute to heritage conservation and local development towards the universal goal of, of a sustainable future. The three-part webinar on policy recommendations are complemented by 18 webinars focused on tools for improvement and realities of tourism in the field notably in some 40 World Heritage Sites in about 30 countries in four continents, during which the draft policy recommendations will be examined for their usefulness, and, and if they are deemed unrealistic, to see how they can become more pertinent. So before ending my introductory remarks, let me thank all the people, including those providing technical and logistic support who have participated in collecting, reviewing, and editing some 210 policy recommendations and, and putting together these 21 events 
involving in my last account, I think about 132 speakers, which we hope will soon be joined by hundreds of attendees online. And I hope that you will all join us in this incredible initiative, which we really hope will become a global movement. So Maria, I turn the screen to you to introduce the proceedings of the webinars today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Minja, for this excellent uh, introduction. Can I invite now uh, Valentina to share the teaser film? destructive effects on the environment and which destabilizes local communities whose profits are seized by companies based in other countries. Yet tourism is a platform and vehicle to present heritage to a wide audience, to support preservation while contributing to economic and social sustainability. It is the mechanism that allows preservation and protection of heritage itself. But this requires awareness from all stakeholders and the involvement of local communities and the use of appropriate management tools, especially nowadays when tourism and heritage sites are exposed to critical changes from both within and from without. Our World Heritage believes that defining the key principles of mutually beneficial interrelationship between heritage and tourism is crucial. These challenges include the ramifications of COVID-19 and the subsequent global economic and social crises. We maintain that it is imperative to pave the way for a conceptual and practical vision in the interrelationship between heritage, tourism and development, thus a need to dismantle previous outdated concepts. We are an interdisciplinary team of universities and researchers, NGOs, businesses and institutions. We strive to rebuild new collaborative paradigms between heritage and tourism. We wish to offer tools, methods and approaches capable of responding to the challenges of our time in an effort to develop meaningful and mutually supportive synergies, which will ensure continuity, resilience and sustainability of heritage and tourism alike. You are invited to take part in our exchanges and discussions in the course of 2021. Heritage. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Valentina. You can discover this film uh, on different media, uh, on the Facebook page of the Tourism Film, as well as on YouTube. Uh, may I invite again those who are not uh, uh, presenters today to turn off their cameras. Thank you so much. This is for the recording reasons. Thanks a lot for your understanding. I will share the PowerPoint again, and I will try to present you uh, now more specifically this tourism uh, month. So as Minja said, uh, February will be the month totally dedicated to tourism. We will have during this month 21 events, 210 recommendations on 21 different themes, uh, striving to contribute to the 2021 uh, debates. Let me pass very, very briefly uh, an overview of the events organized during this month. We will have, first of all, our three policy uh, events, starting from the one of today. And we hope to see you again on February the 8th and 15th. We also have several, um, several regional and thematic events, uh, three events in India, one event in the Mediterranean, one event in France, one in Uzbekistan, one in Quebec, one are uh, more uh, organized around the uh, challenges of uh, uh, working with the tourism industry. One more thematical on big data, tourism and work heritage sites. One um, in Latin America, another in Africa, 
and one in China. We will also have an associated event with ESAC, and as Minja reminded before, our closing event will take place on February the 26th. Events can play a very important role by bringing together people from all around the world and by offering a platform for exchange across borders, disciplines, and sectors. However, we hope to contribute to the tourism debate in relation with heritage beyond 2021. This is why we asked to several researchers and businesses or institution representatives to submit recommendations for better synergies between tourism and heritage. We hope to contribute with pragmatic and realistic policy recommendations. Not all of them are new, but all of them are today necessary. And if they are not new, this maybe means that even if there is already a consensus since several years on most issues, it still is difficult to take the necessary measures to implement them. In terms of methodology concerning the recommendations collection, we started with the sustainable development goals and we invited our colleagues and partners to make recommendations on heritage and tourism, allowing to achieve these uh, sustainable development goals. We collected recommendations on SDGs 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 9, 11, 13, 16, and 17. We also collected recommendations on uh, other themes spontaneously submitted by our uh, respondents. Uh, we, of course, took into consideration the considerable work that has already been done by uh, WTO and other ONGs, as well as by the private sector. There are many. Let me just mention here, as an example, the work done by WTO on the Tourism Development Report with the analysis of the relationship between tourism in general and the SDGs. And you can have here um, in these uh, slides uh, different recommendations concerning tourism for SDGs, for example, 1, 5, or 11. We also must mention here the UNESCO World Heritage Sustainable Tourism Program, which has achieved tremendous progress to help creating the conditions to understand the tourism as a partner for development in World Heritage Sites. Private partners are also contributing to these evolutions. We can here, uh, as an example, the Trade Right Foundation, a nonprofit affiliate of the Travel Corporation, TTC, a multinational group of travel and hotel brands in 70 countries, member of the World Travel and Tourism Council. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel, but we believe that civil society has really a role to play in these evolutions. We organized the recommendations we collected in four main families. Let me present here very, very briefly the 21 uh, themes. Uh, the first family of recommendations is about economic development and well being. So uh, we collected here recommendations about tourism and the no poverty goal, good health and well being, tourism as a means to build resilient infrastructure, promote sustainable industrialization, and foster innovation as well as tourism and host communities. For the second group, equity, peace, and social justice, fraternity, and solidarity, we collected our recommendations about tourism and gender equality, tourism for peace and justice, tourism contribution to fraternity and solidarity, and partnerships for the goals. For the third um, group of recommendations, we collected uh, proposals for tourism and the Clean Water Challenge, tourism and climate action, special planning and design guidelines, and tourism infrastructure benefiting local inhabitants. Finally, for the uh, fourth uh, theme on intellectual development, we collected recommendations about tourism and quality education, tourism as a means to fight illicit excavation and trade in heritage, tourist management and heritage interpretation, 
better inclusion of the intangible aspects of the world heritage in the tourism uh, proposals, built resilient marketing and branding heritage sites, tourism and world heritage values, management of heritage and tourism, better marketing and technologies for special monitoring of uh, tourism. Uh, each recommendation addresses a specific target. 10 different targets have been pre-identified. The World Heritage Committee, the advisory bodies, UNESCO, governments, state parties, uh, local authorities, tourism industries, universities, schools, media, and NGOs. All the recommendations are uh, presented theme by theme on the website of the uh, Our World Heritage Initiative. We invite you to read them and to critically react to those recommendations. We really would like to hear from you. We will build on your feedback. At the end of this month, we will work on your suggestions, ideas, and critics. The final recommendations will be yours. We count on you to spread the word and encourage your professional partners, institutions, uh, academics to give feedback. You can react to all 21 themes or simply choose the ones with whom you are more familiar or seem more crucial for you. For today, we opted for a more transversal approach in order to discuss some of the recommendations. Um, among the um, uh, 210 recommendations I mentioned before, made by different researchers and heritage and tourism specialists, we have chosen today to present recommendations aiming at uh, facing three main problems, three main challenges concerning tourism today. Measure and understand the tourism, evaluate the tourism, and catch, understand the big image. I will start uh, with the first session today, better quantitative and qualitative knowledge of tourism. In fact, and this is quite paradoxical, even in over-touristified heritage sites, there remains many unknown aspects of tourism. The exact numbers of tourists, the special patterns of their visitation, their practices, their behavior are over understudied and under evaluated. Moreover, the multifaceted relations between the local communities and the tourism are often very poorly studied and understood with the plurality of the different and often opposing local voices being amalgamated. This tends to mislead decision-making contributing to local conflicts and tensions. So for this first session, and among other possible dimensions of measurement of tourism, we invited colleagues to make recommendations on three very precise points. So Carmelo uh, Ignacolo, a researcher at MIT, will make recommendations aiming at using granular spatial data in order to better uh, follow spatial patterns of tourism. Joel Mansfield from the University of Haifa will make recommendations aiming at understanding the multiple complexities of local communities and eventually the opposing interests and expectations of local communities vis-a-vis -vis to tourism. Then, based on the hypothesis of the invisibilization of women on heritage sites, Céline Tasté and Nassima Mohamdi from Paris Swan Pantheon Sorbonne University will insist on the need to fully see and appreciate the role women play in relation with tourism. With no transition, I give the floor to Carmelo Ignacolo. Floor is yours, Carmelo. Honored to get the conversation started today. Uh, my name is Carmelo, I'm a researcher at MIT and adjunct faculty of digital technologies for urban design at Columbia University GSAP. And in my work, I employ quantitative methodologies, maps, and visualization techniques to study cities and the built environment. 
So as Minja highlighted before, uh, the first volume of the 2017 uh, WTO Tourism for the Netherlands report states that the lack of consistent comparable data on the social, environmental and economic impact of tourism is a challenge for evidence-based policymaking. Tourism, in fact, while being broadly recognized as a social, cultural, and economic phenomenon, still lacks specific monitoring strategies that aim to understand its spatial implications over time. For example, in several World Heritage sites, due to the lack of digital monitoring infrastructure, there is scarcity of interactive light maps, as that one you're seeing on the left-hand side on the screen, that could reveal people movements patterns and human behavior responses to the built environment. And more specifically, World Heritage Sites managers and public authorities um, often lack granular spatial data that can be employed for um, better evidence-based decision-making concerning tourism. So in a nutshell, this recommendation is fundamentally about more evidence-based and community-supported decisions in the management of tourism. And I want to highlight four key pillars of this recommendation. The first one is the development of monitoring tools, such as Wi-Fi sniffers, urban sensing objects, 360 degree cameras to map street, street views, um, launch of open data portals on tourism. And this includes also data from industries in short-term rentals, for example, or experiential tourism. Third pillar is about production of live and interactive visualization that could better reveal how tourism dynamics unfold within the built environment. And the fourth pillar that I want to share with you today is about the continual and participatory data collection approach. So monitoring tourism performance and its impact must be kept up to date and allow for collecting potential case studies at a grassroots level. I also want to briefly clarify that the need for spatial data that I'm arguing for does not sit under a sort of renewed quest for a sort of 21st century technocracy. Like my hope is that through visualizations and data collection, we could open public debates about tourism in our cities and our war heritage sites. Decisions won't come from the top, but they will share and discuss from the bottom up through the data and maps that are revealed about our cities. In conclusion, I know that this might sound sort of surreal in this time to speak about over tourism during a global pandemic. However, researchers have already informed us that the demand to travel will have a skyrocketing increase in our post-pandemic future. And we need to be prepared to face post-COVID-19 tourism in order to take more site-specific solutions that could enhance and protect our heritage sites. Thank you so much. And I will pass the word to the following speaker from the uh, University of Haifa. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Carmelo. So with no transition, the floor is yours, um, Joel. Let me just. Thank you, Maria. Thank, Thank you for the invitation to come and speak to you this afternoon and good afternoon to everybody. My name is Yoel Mansfeld. I'm a professor of tourism planning and development at the University of Haifa in Israel. And I'm very glad to be here today with all of you sharing my recommendations on how to improve and protect our world heritage in terms of community tourism relationship. I must admit that for the 25, the last uh, 25 years I've been studying these relationships and I'm glad to share some of my leading observations today uh, with you, uh, both in, in terms of my presentation and the questions and answers sessions later on. So let's start with the rationale. In terms of the rationale, uh, I have isolated uh, three arguments which uh, I want to share with you. The first one, is that host communities wish to be recognized as full-fledged stakeholders that may affect tourism and can be affected by tourism. The second argument is that every host community is different in terms of its attitude towards tourism development, its limits for acceptable change, and its actual and perceived living spaces. And the third argument is that tourism intervention in residential spaces uh, and heritage spaces and the consequent emerging locals attitude toward tu towards tourism development and operation is a dynamic phenomenon that may change over time and space. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, my recommendations stemming from the above rationale are twofold actually. The first recommendation is that potential and actual host communities 
should be involved and heard in any platform engaged in formulating tourism policies, tourism planning, tourism development, and operation of tourism and hospitality installations, uh, primarily in cases of community-based or what we call community-centered projects overlapping with heritage sites. The second recommendation is that there is a need to introduce two major elements in any plan developed and operation operating of tourism projects involved in host communities. First, development and delivery of local tourism training and education systems. The second is adopting a relative sustainability approach. Tourism education may foster locals' appreciation of hosting values, while relative sustainability is achieved when sustainability standards are determined by the host community, bottom-up, and are based on attainable rather than fixed predefined sustainable goals that come top, top five to the local level. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yuel, for your recommendations. And uh, I invite now uh, Céline Tasté to present hers. Hello, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so we have been working on the same World Heritage Site and Gender Equality with uh, Nasima Mohamdi in relation with the SDG 5. We are both young researchers in geography and anthropology and working on field works in France, Togo and Morocco. Our recommendations come from a very simple proposal. World Heritage Sites must be models. Models in terms of conservation, heritage management, research, and we also consider they have a role to play in addressing social justice issues. World Heritage Sites are international showcases and must be impeccable. And even we think they can be leaders. Among the subjects of social justice, gender equality is crucial when we talk about tourism for several reasons. One of them is that according to the UNTWO, more than half of the worldwide workforce in the industry are women in general, not just in World Heritage Sites. This fact seems to indicate that tourism offers opportunity to women. However, when we look at it closely, it can be both a vector of social and economical integration, as well as a means to maintain disparities. With Nassim we developed uh, recommendations following three main axes to address those challenges. The first axis is actually to encourage a better qualitative and quantitative knowledge about gender equality and gender dynamics on World Heritage Sites. The thing is that we don't clearly uh, know the situation on World Heritage Sites concerning gender issues and how are they performing in terms of gender equality. Is the situation better than in other tourist places or is it worse? That is a question. We already have tools that could be used to provide a better understanding of the situation. And we think we could build on that and add functions to those tools in order to fulfill this goal. The first one is the UNESCO chairs supported by the UNITWIN program. The chairs are spaces and groups of reflection, space of cooperation and shared knowledge. They favor the cooperation between universities and institutions. There are several chairs dealing with the subject of women and gender equality. There is one about uh, promote, uh, promotion of gender equality in Colombia, um, also uh, gender equality and women's empowerment in Cyprus or India. Uh, but uh, there is no, uh, no one that is directly dedicated to, her to heritage and tourism. We think gathering researchers and professionals in the field studying gender equality on World Heritage Site could be a great opportunity to visualize the role of women in the field of heritage and to question it. We think such a chair could be attached to a specific university or could be an itinerant chair, for example. It could be supported by an important female personality and be a rotating chair. It could work on women and conservation, women in interpretation, women and tourism industry, etc. The second proposal concerns, in fact, two tools, World Heritage Applications and Periodical Report, and it targets state governments and advisory body. 
we think we could use this in order to gather information from the field and to be able to produce quantitative and qualitative data. More than a way to create new criteria in order to add sites on the list, we think it could be a way to sensitize the state's site manager, etc. With these tools, we could, for example, gather information and measure the place of women in site management offices, official interpreters in the publics, etc. And also learn about the specific initiative concerning gender equalities uh, created by site managers or heritage officers. It could be a great bottom-up tool to understand the local dynamics, problems the sites are facing, and the local solution designed on the sites. We have chosen to present those recommendations because they seem to us very concrete and feasible proposals, capable of producing stimulating research perspective and food for thought for site managers and professionals in the field. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much to all three of you, to Carmela, to Yuel, and to, to Celine and to Nassima for these first recommendations concerning the first issue, the first question that we are trying to deal with means a better knowledge about what tourism really represents on heritage sites. Now the floor is open and uh, Minja will take your questions from the chat and will ask to the, um, to the presenters. You can uh, ask your questions directly on the chat and you can eventually target one presenter or all three presenters, if eventually your question concerns uh, all of them. Ninja floor is well, uh, I think in the chat, I think people were so busy listening to the presentations <laughs> that we haven't received too many questions. But let me say that with, uh, you know, with all the years that I've been working you know, on uh, more of the heritage conservation, not so much on the tourism, uh, repeatedly, we, we hear about the bottom-up approach. In the presentations today, all three speakers uh, spoke very much about the necessity of this bottom-up approach. But, um, you know, how are we going to get this, make this happen? I mean, we, we cannot ignore the fact that, um, you know, that there are countries that are quite repressive and they don't want a bottom-up approach. It's a complete top-down approach. So uh, let me just ask all of you, I mean, starting from Carmelo and Yael and uh, Celine, and how do you go about, what is the best uh, solution to really foster a bottom-up approach, including in countries that are not necessarily democratic? Celine? Uh, okay. uh, it's a tough question, I would say. <laughs> um, but I, I think I'd, uh, I, I would not have like um, a solution uh, to give, um, but I think creating spaces to share experiences of the sites. And I, um, I say that because I have the experience and I talked about the, the chair, the UNESCO chair. And um, I think, uh, and I'm thinking about the chair uh, hold by Maria about culture development and tourism. And in this kind of uh, sites, you can have um, shared experience uh, from site managers. And I think uh, those opportunities are very stimulating. Uh, of course, this is a bottom-up uh, approach, but for officials, for heritage uh, officers, um, of course, uh, then maybe my colleagues would have other yeah. answers um, on the um, field. So I'm going to leave that the last remarks to Joel, but uh, Carmelo, how can your very technology oriented um, means of a bottom up approach. How can that be realized? Uh, thanks for asking this, Minja. I think it's a very tough question, as Celine mentioned before. Yeah. I mean, getting into the details of the uh, politics of where our sites, our heritage sites are located. But I believe that what is different from the past is that we now have uh, access and capacity to deal with these tools uh, worldwide. I mean, we have for example, GS tools that are open source and can be accessed like everywhere in the world, which was something that was not really common in the past. So I believe that through the availability of these tools worldwide and the network of um, civic uh, enthusiasts and the people who are really like on top of the dynamics and the challenges of their site, 
we could produce this uh, visualization that I was talking about as a base to enable a discussion. I mean, I don't see the visual outcomes as a sort of a result of what needs to be, for example, better preserved, better maintained. That's just an enabler to a larger conversation that was mainly uncommon before because of the lack of the availability of these tools worldwide. So I, this is an interesting point to really make a, uh, a claim about it. Like we can, we can change how we interact with our site depending on how they are represented on maps, visualization and how people can question what is represented on these drawings as a community rather than as top-down decision makers. Okay, uh, Joel? Yes, I, I must admit it's a tough one, but I, yeah. I think I have a partial solution to that. Uh, in democratic countries, it goes without saying, it's a, it's a matter of culture, of culture of planning and decision-making and culture of uh, participation, allowing participation of communities to be uh, responsible and part of decision-making. Uh, in developing countries and non-democratic countries, as uh, you mentioned, I think that uh, the best solution is to operate, it, operate top down uh, the conditions under which uh, countries will get uh, support for tourism development and, and, and conversion of, of heritage sites into tourism facilities. So if you need the financial assistance, this will be conditioned by international financial bodies. Uh, and, and they will say, okay, you want the money? Okay, you have to comply with our, our policies uh, regarding local, locals, local community participation and so on and so forth in terms of know-how and, and stuff like that. Everything has to be conditioned. Uh, and uh, if they don't, don't comply with it, uh, then you you don't get the, the the support from the big brother. Okay. Now I have some specific questions to Carmelo. And how do you see the role of social media companies collaborating on world heritage for world heritage? The power of tracking subscribers to this service is both power but also responsibility. Could be could they be approached by crowdsourcing and providing best examples for sustainable development? Carmelo, any comment on that question? Yeah, thank you, Minja, and thanks, uh, Mario, for, for asking this question. I, I, I mean, there are untapped potentials, to be honest, in that, in that field. There are some serious problematic concerns about privacy that needs to be addressed and we need to have in mind. So I will not make the life easy here and saying, yes, let's take it, like, let's use it. We're going to get great results. I mean, we have to be extremely careful about who is going to manage this data set, who are the authorities involved in that. But to be honest, it's, it's really necessarily to have a conversation with these uh, private agencies, not only like social media companies, but uh, I think like we, we discussed this throughout our like meetings last month about the role of uh, private companies in, in the tourism industry. I mean, as far as public authorities can put forward like policy and like a recommendation and solution, we need to engage the private industry into this debate. And one way of doing it is trying to draft and like have agreement about data sharing purposes because the amount of data that it's collected through the private uh, industries might definitely benefit, will definitely benefit communities and public authorities. So I would respond to question through the question that Mario raised, like, yes, we need to collaborate with them. The question is how to do that ethically in a way that privacy and like uh, data are going to be like protected for not only the tourists who are going to visit their site, but the communities who are living within those sites. Yeah. And that leads me to the other uh, intervention saying, well, how do you uh, move from doing something for the communities or and to talking with the communities on their own. So Yawen, who's, you've had a lot of experience in this field, have you found it uh, very difficult to engage the local communities in uh, mm -hmm. finding out more about their role or enhancing their role? Well, very much depends on, again, on the local culture and the, the, the level of uh, awareness what tourism can do both positively and uh, negatively. From my experience, uh, one of the uh, recommendations I gave, I gave to my students that if you 
work in such countries and such uh, destinations, uh, please involve local advisors and local consultants that uh, speak the, the, the language and understand the culture uh, and understand the cultural nuances in terms of the uh, uh, limits of acceptable change and the general attitude of, of, uh, of communities towards the, the impact of tourism, uh, tourism development. Yeah, on that note, on the limits of acceptable change, we have a, um, we have a question from Wendy Nirianti from Indonesia, whose book on uh, heritage tourism or tourism has been really a uh, groundbreaking one in the context of Asia. So, so what her question is that um, the concept of limits of acceptable, acceptable change, it's acceptable to whom, you know, consider that world heritage has multi-stakeholders uh, from uh, the local communities all the way to the central, provincial, local authorities. So who's, who's going to be deciding what's acceptable? Yoel again? Well, that's another tricky question. <laughs> Uh, normally, when we, we use this term, the limits for acceptable change, we, we, we speak about fractions of the local community. The local community being a stakeholder is not a monolithic organ. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in so many communities, there are initial conflicts even before uh, tourism development has started. Uh, just uh, knowing and, and understanding that tourism is going to uh, be introduced uh, may, uh, may uh, cause some kind of conflicts within different fractions of the community, uh, let alone other stakeholders. I think that they, the social and cultural uh, and anthropological discourse on uh, limits for acceptable change uh, limits itself into the discourse on the different frequent, uh, fractions of the local communities. It doesn't deal with other decision makers and other stakeholders. Okay, and also, uh, now to um, Celine. And uh, there's a comment that unless women have control of trade, such as selling on the webcam, and can they have any control? Uh, how is it possible to couple um, trade skills and technology? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the comment. Um, yes, actually, so in, in this part, we were just dealing with the recommendation on the better knowledge on the dynamics. Uh, but then, and I think that would be, uh, we will have answers in the second part of the intervention where I will speak about uh, engaging women in a tourist economy. Uh, and I think this part, this part is very critical about uh, training women in the digital um, um, aspect of tourism. And, uh, and I, I hope maybe I, I could answer that uh, in, the next, uh, in the next intervention. Yeah. Okay, I think, uh, Maria, we don't have any more time, no, but I think one crucial point to bear in mind through, as we listen to the other interventions and suggested recommendations is the big um, issue of the science and the policy interface. And how do you, uh, can you, how can you research to do, to make that nexus, you know, from policy into practice? So that's gonna be a major challenge. And I can assure you that some of these issues are gonna be coming up in not just the, the, the two other policy debate uh, webinars, but in a lot of the ground truthing uh, seminars of uh, presenting, as I said, some uh, case studies of about 40 different world heritage sites that we'll be listening to over the next, uh, uh, over the next weeks. So um, do we have any more time? I didn't keep track of the time. We do. The question is extremely interesting. So if there are any uh, burning questions, you can take one or two more. Yeah. Okay, so one thing is very concrete. It's a question, another question to Carmelo. Is that, can you give a positive example? Can you give an example of a world heritage site or any heritage site where tourism monitoring and uh, data sharing is working well? And yeah, that's to Joel, Joel, is uh, how do you refer to a positive example where bottom up sets standards for tourism development? So two concrete examples that we're asking you for are uh, Camelo and then- Yeah, very shortly, like the first project that comes to my mind is a project that was developed within the University of Roma La Sapienza about like world heritage, natural world heritage sites in, uh, in, uh, in Mozambique as well. There was, was like an idea of 
how to, to map the challenges related to tourism and also oil extraction. So I would recommend to check the work that Luca Malatesta is doing on that, on that hand and eventually um, some other uh, app or data collection system that will be developed. I know that that's a specific like natural oriented heritage sites, mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of other tools, let me think like another one that I personally use at, at MIT in, uh, in Nairobi as well was like crowdsourcing system for uh, transit in the city. And, and that was another participatory action that was developed within the Digital Matatus project with Professor Sire Williams. So there are a couple of examples. I mean, they're not always specifically target to tourism because at the end, the more we know about our cities, regardless of the, of the topic of, of, of implication, the better it is for different angles of, of view. So um, we also need to be sort of open-minded towards like tools that have been developed, not necessarily in our realm of, of expertise, but also in other, in other areas. And I hope that's uh, okay for, yeah. for the answer. Joel? Can you repeat the question, please? I was looking at the chat and... Uh... Yeah, the, the question is like, um, how, oh, wait a moment. Um, the question is, wait a moment. Uh, yeah, uh, so, so an, an example, I mean, they're asking for an, uh, any specific example that you're aware of where the bottom up approach to set has, has actually worked in terms of tourism development. Is there any particular place that you are aware of where you've researched where this yes. is happening successfully? Yes, 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 yes. I'll, I'll be very brief. The, the, uh, the example uh, which is known to many of my colleagues who participated in a workshop in 2011 in the city of Akko in Israel, which is a World Heritage Site, uh, but was was really uh, difficult to to develop tourism there because of animosity between the predominantly Arab population living within the old city of Akko and uh, government agencies that uh, were supposed to uh, uh, to help developing uh, tourism in this, in this fantastic town and very much based on on the workshop we were where we conducted an evaluation of the locals uh, relationship with the uh, governmental agencies we realized that one of the problem is that there's lack of communication between them uh, tourism is developed uh, on top of the local community and not with the local community mm. and since uh, we submitted a report about it things have dramatically changed and, and now the, the situation, the tourism situation in Africa is absolutely fantastic uh, in, in, all, in all aspects. Uh, uh, the city is booming. Uh, people really see the advantage of introducing uh, cultural and heritage tourism to Akko. Uh, locals are be benefiting economically and so on and so forth. So it's, it's just a matter of, of imposing and introducing uh, the right methodology and the right policy uh, to to create this kind of understanding and, and uh, coexist. Good. Well, we have also in the chat box uh, that I think most of you can see uh, some uh, recommendations on good case study platforms. And uh, I won't read them out now, but uh, we'll certainly uh, transmit that to uh, all of the participants through our website. So uh, one last question, I think, is for Celine. Uh, again, a, quite a general one, but a very important one, is uh, how to improve equality and reduce poverty in the rural zones through empowerment of local people. You know, it's one thing, I think a lot of us work, are more conscious about uh, what happens in the um, urban area, uh, even in developed mm -hmm. countries. But how about in the rural areas, particularly in the developing countries? Celine? Mm -hmm. um, Yes, I think we also um, probably addressed some of the, those issues um, on the some of the recommendation we've made on leadership, women's leadership. So um, uh, to that, uh, probably I could invite uh, everybody to go on Qualtrics to to comment on that. But then I would say that uh, training and um, accompanying uh, women's projects probably. Um, from the field, like the, the, the local initiative would probably uh, be um, 
one of the one of the, the very important uh, factor to contribute to uh, their uplifting, mm -hmm. I think. And also to formalize the, their work, because most of the time they, they, are in, they can be in very unstable uh, situations. Um, so I think providing uh, job security, training, and uh, support for uh, their own projects, I think that could be a way to answer to that. Yeah. But as we move forward to the other debates in the days to come, I think there's a sort of a lasting um, you know, concern which is that while we talk about sustainability of and community involvement in tourism, I mean, how can this be possible in many, many economies, many, many countries where it's the tourism business, it's the tourism industry uh, that is actually giving impetus to the development and who are also the job providers? I mean, how much say can a simple employee in different categories of the tour tour tourism industry, have their voices heard? I mean, how is this possible? Of course, we can say government, yes, you know, you have to involve them and you have to be democratic. But I mean, the fundamental, my question number one, is the starting point of, I mean, what can, what, can be, what can be done in countries that continue to exploit people, that continue to, uh, you know, uh, squeeze, uh, uh, the, 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 the poor, especially the women. So, I mean, I'm not uh, expecting answers on that right away, mm -hmm. but I think that we should keep that in mind because the more I have been reading on different principles, recommendations, you know, having worked in the UN for 30 years, I mean, with, you know, our sort of bread and butter, rice and fish is about, <laughs> is about uh, you know, policies and recommendations. But I mean, how is this gonna be possible in certain countries? Okay, Yoel mm -hmm. said, you, you, can, you can tie uh, aid, the official development aid to certain kinds of behaviors, you know. But I mean, we, we are aware of, of uh, how um, uh, these things have, have a, a limit. So I mean, again, I don't want to open the debate now because these are fundamental issues. But I think that we, have, we cannot forget the fact that there are still, unfortunately, the great majority of countries in this world who claim to be democratic, but who are not. So I think that we have to find ways, I mean, including technology, how can we use technology to uh, mobilize these people who are oppressed? You know, these are issues that are really important for our future, and especially as we work towards a, a new development paradigm uh, in, in uh, working towards uh, 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 the sustainable development goals. So uh, with that, um, Maria, can we yes. go on to the next? Thanks, Thanks a lot, Minja. And as exactly you said, this is the very beginning of our discussion. And we really hope that uh, you will be with us in the next meetings, because the idea is really to create a more holistic approach about all those issues, not only in terms of uh, recommendations, but also on recommendation about the right methodology mm -hmm. we need to invent in order to implement those recommendations. And this is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And this can be done if we stay together, if we think together, and if, as I said before, you feed the recommendations, you respond to the recommendation, you critically respond to recommendation. The idea is not to say, yes, no, this is nice, this is not nice. The idea is to say, okay, this recommendation is very important, but this is what we need in order to be able to implement this recommendation. This recommendation would only be possible under this, this, and that condition. So we really need your feedback. We are in the very start of this process. We hope to spend this month with you and please participate not only to the three policy debates, February 8th and February 15th again, but also to all the other events. Somebody mentioned before in the chat that uh, some issues that uh, um, uh, were um, discussed today concerning um, big data, for example, we'll have a dedicated event on February 22nd and Carmelo will be again there and we, we, he will have more time to uh, answer to all your questions. So please keep this in mind and to try to, uh, let's try to move together uh, all through this month on all those extremely important uh, issues. This is really, again, the very beginning. Let but me now introduce- Before, the uh, before switching, just one 
uh, thing. Um, you had also very pointedly said that when we talk about local communities, it's not at all uh, one local community. There are multiple categories of local communities. So uh, one, I think that we also need to bear that in mind. And some of the case studies that we'll be presenting in different countries with different cultures will also find, you know, we'll be able to better understand how to distinguish the different interests of the local communities. So, okay, Absolutely. with that. Uh... Absolutely. And this is also, I mean, what you said, Minja, is very important because it will allow us also to create connections between those different debates, which obviously are put in a different way in the different contexts because contexts are fundamentally uh, different. Let me now introduce the second session because I, we needed to give time also for uh, all our colleagues. So I will share again the PowerPoint and I will go now to the second session, which is about good indicators for tourism performances on World Heritage sites. Well, we know all of us that, that tourism performance is unfortunately usually measured mainly on the basis of quantitative criteria. However, today, more than in the past, in a um, pre-COVID over-touristified context, as well as in a post-COVID uh, context, qualitative um, criteria will be more necessary than ever and quantitative uh, criteria are clearly not enough. Um, it is not acceptable, we believe, anymore to consider that regions and countries should present every year more and more tourists in order to be considered as successful, touristically successful. Tourism has impacts on uh, heritage sites, positive impacts and negative impacts. A holistic range of criteria must be taken into consideration and the smart and qualitative criteria are required. This implies a paradigm shift from a performance in terms of numbers of visitors to more qualitative performance criteria. So we will have uh, for this second session uh, two uh, presentations. Uh, Norberto Santos from Coimbra University will insist on the need to take into consideration the sustainable strategies of local enterprises and therefore to introduce more qualitative indicators allowing to measure and to encourage and to reward their performances. And Zachary jo Jones from Politecnico di Milano will stress on the need of developing a set of climate action indicators. So the idea of this session is to say, stop with numbers or stop with only numbers. Let's take also into consideration other criteria, the number of the quality of local jobs, the impact of, uh, on carbon footprint, which are among many other important indicators for tourism that um, heritage destinations must take into uh, consideration. With no transition, I give the floor to uh, Norberto Santos from Coimbra University, who will present his recommendations. Norberto, floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, today uh, with you all. Well, uh, nowadays tourism should be considered uh, well being asset, not only for those who travel. Uh, to foster a better society, tourism must be a part of our daily life. To this end, uh, tourism stakeholders must innovate and have the capability to adapt to an ever-changing market, always respecting the host communities. Technological digital innovation in terms of heritage qualifies and enriches the tourism experience. An array of smart technologies can thus play a key role in reaching such, such a goal, especially after this catastrophic COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, given the difficulty in recognizing the social and cultural role of many companies, a support strategy with positive discrimination is needed for companies that excel in this area. The traditional strategies of tourism companies tend to be concentrated and concerned with tourism demand and attracting visitors to destinations. 
last century business model was to produce as cheaply and quickly as possible. These must be replaced. Uh, making money should not be the most significant objective. objective. We need to profit, but we need also to have social purpose goals on the demand side as in tourism supply. Companies should wisely perceive and internalize in their strategies that sustainable is better, healthier is better, more human is better. They need to respect above all human rights and equality, namely gender equality, have the best working conditions and attend to environmental issues and social responsibility. Companies that promote these ideals must have competitive advantages through the recognition of public entities. Today's new policy action frameworks lead to objectives that include integration and collaboration across different agencies and different levels of government, role of government, which should choose those companies to be preferred partners. Recommend uh, recommendations we um, say that it's important to increase the access to small scale industrial companies and other companies in developing countries to financial services, including affordable credit and their integration into value chains and markets. The first point, create a ranking of companies according to their area of tourism system. The ranking will be done uh, on several parameters, multi-criteria analysis, as current level of convergence with SDGs, social involvement with the community, contribution to residents' quality of life, revenue and communities offered to human resources, environmental policy respect and promotion, innovative strategies in terms of managing of human resources, new technologies integration, sustainability, safety and hygiene standards, social responsibility initiatives, gender equity. As, uh, uh, it's important that certifications can be grouped according to fun functional areas of tourism, such as attractions, restaurants and catering services, destinations, transport and mobility services. Second point, create a portal na at national level uh, of companies with ecological certification. There are dozens of eco-labels operating at national and global scales, which allow for the promotion and sustainable practice in the respective areas to which they belong. It's important to carry out a life cycle analysis with a systematic decomposition of, of any products or services and assessment of social, economic and environmental impacts. Efficient environmental management is intended, demanding responsibility and ethics from those who produce. To do so, companies need to, to upgrade. In Portugal, we have good practices performed by NEST, Tourism Innovation Center, with incubation and acceleration services in partnership with the ecosystem, advising micro, small, and medium-sized tourism enterprises, development of new products and technologies and experimentation, creation and validation of prototypes, international promotion of, of startups and innovation. A third point and last point, uh, to define public policies that encourage domestic tourism and give place to small and medium local tourism companies. Tax benefits for local domestic consumers at hotels, restaurants, tourist attractions during the official holidays period. Raising awareness among the school age population, high schools and universities, of the cultural, historical, and landscape value of, of their countries, making their visit and their time of leisure nationwide a priority. Last but not least important, promotion of an online campaign or oriented to boost domestic tourism, potentially create package deals to appeal to local, regional, and national population to travel for leisure purpose outside their home environment to rural or urban destinations, and to use small scale accumulation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Norberto. Uh, with no transition, I invite uh, Zachary Jones to present his recommendations. Hi, thank you, Maria. Uh, when we start thinking about the interaction between heritage and tourism at the local scale, we very quickly see all sorts of issues 
to identify and study and address as we've seen here already today and, and again over the coming weeks. But when we go up to the macro scale and we start looking at the global effects, um, they begin to emerge other issues that might not be so easily identifiable on a site-specific uh, perspective. And of course, in dealing with the issue of climate change, um, that becomes very apparent very quickly. And in recent years, studies have, multiple studies have really focused on and pointed out uh, the growing contribution of the tourism industry to uh, the global greenhouse emissions. Uh, in fact, in a 2008 study, uh, when travel as well as all of the other sort of related tourism industries were tallied up, they found that 8% of total greenhouse global uh, gas emissions were coming from the tourism industry. And so there's really an urgent need uh, to address this issue, uh, to on one hand, start trying to promote more local or regional tourism as opposed to uh, sort of international visits and also be developing more sustainable modes and travel technologies um, that we can start implementing and promoting uh, quickly in order to try to bring down the industry's overall impact. Uh, as been, has already been noted today, of course, in 2020, um, we've seen a massive reduction in tourism due to COVID-19. Yet securely in the future going forward, um, those numbers will continue to grow to pre, you know, return to pre-pandemic levels, as well as the pre-pandemic growth rate, um, seeing an increasing percentage of uh, the sort of growing carbon footprint on an annual level. And so this recommendation, uh, which again, like all of the ones we've discussed here today, is sort of one aspect out of many issues to be considered, but would be to develop a set of climate action indicators uh, that work to demonstrate the direct and indirect carbon footprint of heritage sites or cities based on overall consumption, energy and waste generated, as well as the transport of tourist arrivals. Um, now, this is by no means the first uh, a uh, attempt to create a sustainable index for uh, heritage cities. There are many such examples. Um, yet in many of those cases, um, there's the approach to sustainability is so broad in order to bring together the socioeconomic and cultural uh, aspects, which are equally important. Um, but in some of these cases, the hundreds of criteria uh, that get calculated and all of the indicators perhaps overshadow the very real and direct uh, contribution uh, to global greenhouse emissions. So this would attempt to try to sway um, that approach so far, whereas many of those indexes perhaps, rather than giving a, a fully accurate or pure picture of sustainability, tend to promote or reflect more a level of development. Um, and so more developed countries are seen as perhaps being more sustainable because of um, you know, all of the services already in place and existing. Mm -hmm. And so this would attempt to take this sort of global issue. Um, again, many studies have looked at uh, the contribution of the tourism industry um, its carbon footprint as, as sort of holistically to try to break it down and perhaps assign it to specific sites. Um, and this would again, maybe help to shift the balance and promote less recognized sites. As Maria, you were already uh, just saying that we don't need to continue this pro-growth, constant continuously pro-growth mentality about heritage tourism. Um, and so this might in a way benefit this sort of index, uh, benefit more rural destinations or less developed destinations where there are uh, lower numbers of tourist arrivals um, as well as perhaps less energy or waste produced. And so it, it's a way to, to rethink and maybe tip the balance a bit um, in how heritage sites and destinations are perceived as well as uh, allowing tourists, uh, giving them a tool to rethink perhaps their choices in where they go. So encouraging people to rethink destinations that rather than flying somewhere internationally to visit a very well-known site, going somewhere perhaps closer to home in order to choose somewhere you know, more sustainable and recognizing that their choice to, to travel um, is contributing to the unsustainability of some of these places. Uh, so again, it would require the sort of a proper collection of data that we've already been discussing to inform this and to develop a sort of complex enough uh, system to be able to calculate this or to, to take some of the information uh, that's existing already as you know, I, we have a bit on the left. And so it's not an entirely new idea, but perhaps taking this information and formatting it in a, in a slightly different way to get to the point where we can, instead of thinking about heritage purely for its 
you know, economic benefits uh, to you know raise local uh, property values or purely to grow tourism, to start framing heritage as a tool to help build sustainability in order to increase the sustainability of sites, of the cities, um, and to, to see it in a new light uh, and to be able to use tourism in a positive way and link with all of these other aspects that we're discussing uh, here today and in the upcoming sessions. Uh, so thank you very much and looking forward to questions and, and discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Zach. Thank uh, to, to both of you, Norberto and Zach, for those excellent uh, proposals. I think that uh, uh, they will uh, stimulate several questions because you are opening very huge, very important, very crucial perspectives, both in a local level for Norberto and in a more global and holistic level for uh, Zachary. Um, Ninja. Unmute. Yeah, well, we now have quite a lot of questions. And I think that um, uh, the first question to Noberto, which has actually been answered subsequently by his intervention, is that what mechanism should we adopt in order to reduce the chances that financing tourism companies in developing countries will create the, a dependency syndrome and also the leakage effects? It's a very broad question. And I think, in Noberto, in your very, very rich presentation, you mentioned a lot of existing kind of indicators and existing um, you know, uh, labels. And I think that uh, it would be really good if, uh, bring, not right away, but that we would be able to, uh, res uh, to get some of your, a uh, little bit more details about all the examples that you, that you mentioned. So, but would you like to make a general remark on that, Noberto? Yes, thank you for, for the question. Well, uh, in, in, in this, this area, um, we, have, we have several, several uh, references. Uh, as I said, uh, as I said during the, 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 my presentation, in my recommendation, uh, there are se several ways to do that, to do this, this, uh, this new, new form of relationship between uh, tourism and the destinations and the tourists. Uh, and I, I think it's very important to always use this multi-criteria multi -criteria analysis. It's very important because uh, uh, nowadays we are um, during, during a long, uh, long years. You are, you are, we are depending from only qualitative, qualitative, qu quantitative uh, references, and we uh, we need to to get uh, to people. Uh, it's important to get to people, and to do that, we need to to read people closely, uh, to to learn about people uh, closely about people, and it's important to to have this this main references about uh, the way they live, the living, uh, the, 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 the they live, uh, the way they live in, in this day to day, day to day, uh, and have uh, some, uh, to know how, how, what they want uh, and to know, to listen to them uh, uh, we, we, we jointly, joint, joint, uh, jointly with, with uh, of course, the, the public, the, pub, the public uh, sector, the, the private sector, but also all communities need to, to be listened. Uh, and to be listened, it, it's important because now nowadays we, we have a, 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 a way of listening people, a different way to listen people. We can listen people also, and, and when when. Uh, when you are asking about uh, about how to listen, how to have uh, the the, the how, how it's possible to to listen those who don't have, uh, are living in democratic areas or in democratic countries. Well, I think nowadays uh, the, the 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 net the net can. Uh, Help us in that. If you have, if you, if we have a platform that help us to have uh, the the that would uh, um, 
permit that people could put their ideas in, 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 in the world, in the, in, in, in the net. It's important that we can listen to them uh, and uh, have, to have a response, a response for, 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 for those, for the, their, their issues, their okay. problems. Uh, uh, I, I think I think now that uh, in Portugal uh, the, this this idea of world government is very important, uh, and I think that this idea of world government and is is uh, present in, in several countries. Uh, I think uh, Portugal, Spain, Denmark, Greece, uh, all of them are, are are playing that that role, that important role, that uh, that. Um, adopt a joint strategy for development of tourism. And it's important to have this strategy strategy to, to, to make, to, to reach rich people, to reach the communities. Um, you, you need this to deploy a, a clear distribution of roles uh, because it's important that the government uh, as a role of government is a role of government because it's important the government be to be in a national, but also in a regional in, and in a local level. Yeah. That is very important. Okay, Noberto, anyway, the thing is, as I mentioned earlier, I think with so many different kinds of criterias uh, and indexes that are necessary, I think uh, even from the beginning, Maria, we've been discussing about the need to really review all the existing uh, um, systems that exist, and, and then to really, I think that's a really important su subject that we should, that our research and practitioners can come together in the months to come as a, a contribution of our tourism team to the overall thing. But so uh, we're running out of, my, of time, but Zaki, can you um, respond to a few of the other questions that we've received, which is a lot to do with the, um, the indicators, but of course, on the promotion of domestic destination. And then, uh, which also uh, links on innovative tourism that we will be also discussing in the events to come. But would you like to say a word about, and also there's a, uh, there's a, someone had mentioned the climate vulnerability uh, index. So mm -hmm. uh, would you go a bit further on that, please? Sure, yeah, I, I appreciate the links that already have been shared. I think that's just a, a very small sample of what already exists and also the very different aspects that we can look at this issue because the uh, something like the Climate Vulnerability Index takes a different approach that really then highlights the threats that climate change puts mm -hmm. onto heritage sites, which of course is an absolutely critical issue. Um, so there's so many different ways to look at this and how the ways that uh, sites are affected and then also um, how they're you know part of the issue themselves or just by what do we do with sites that are so attractive that they're bringing tens of millions of visitors a year and so I, I was framing for me this idea was to sort of shift the thinking or conversation um, and, and also the responsibility. I think that's a big aspect that would need to be defined and also within these indicators considered. Um, I think the comment by George brings that up a bit. Is it fair to put the responsibility to deal with climate change on local communities who are not necessarily wanting or inviting maybe millions of people, yet they're the ones now stuck with perhaps over pollution in their communities and are having a lower quality of life as a result. So I think there's a lot of complexity in it and different angles to look at these from. You're absolutely right. I think a very thorough sort of um, study, and there have been some already of the different indexes and indicators that exist. Um, so there is a, they're, they're very thorough, but also finding, um, yeah, the different aspects there, ticking them apart a bit, and also I think connecting them with some of the other issues That's that have been brought up is, is a key aspect to in the next steps going forward. And again, framing these indicators as one, one step. I think another way could also be developing tools that perhaps a sort of personal calculator, or personal indicator. So if I'm living here and I'm proposing to you know travel somewhere, maybe it tells me what is going to be my individual contribution mm -hmm. as a way to get us to rethink. So 
the putting the not that the blame is entirely individual, but you know it, it helps us to sort of reevaluate or compare possibilities. Um, so I think there are multiple angles to come at this issue uh, that can be explored and, and developed. And so I appreciate. It. I think all of the comments are very important here. So we we need to somehow save and, and collect these. I don't think they'll show up in the video, um, but for ourselves, they're valuable resources. So again, thank you, everyone. Yes, Maria, that's one future, very important future task we have to do. And I think that I'd like to solicit Carmelo, Zaki, um, Nobert, uh, Noberto to sort of put your heads together and to see in what way technology, <laughs> the different indicators and uh, the different uh, uh, criteria of, 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 of uh, the labels can somehow be made into a sort of a coherent package. Uh, Maria, that's a kind of a big task, but I think we really should approach that. Huh? We are starting. We are starting with uh, our tasks this month. And just I think that all of you, and I'm saying this for the uh, participants mainly, you understood how we organized this, uh, these sessions today. It's just a teaser. It's just a teaser. We, we just have chosen a very, very small amount of recommendations. I mean, during the three seminars, we will not be able to present more than 10, 12 recommendations out of the 210 that have been submitted. So it's just a teaser. We are just opening, you know, perspectives. And we really, again, invite you to uh, participate and uh, to give your inputs already in the chat. Uh, we have so many great ideas. I just saw, for example, that Fekri was very inspired by the proposal of Norberto. And I'm sure that Fekri will take our contact with Norberto to uh, go further on this possibility of creating a new index. And I'm sure that all this will give a, a lot of new ideas to all of you, but mm -hmm. we really need to remain connected. Okay. Uh, so we will send you a lot of material, but please, we need you to feed us. It's yep. absolutely important to, uh, to give your, your feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, Minja, I suggest that we move on Before, with the third yeah, We have half an hour, yes. Good. So I think uh, we, have time, we can go back to the chat yeah, and we have a lot of uh, some other questions. But uh, as I said, I mean, we're, Maria and I got involved in this with all of our different partners, not to do, like we're not events oriented. I mean, we, we consider events to be a very important process, uh, but it's not an end in itself. So if we really, really hope that these, um, the 2021 debates on tourism will lead to creating different research groups. And there's such rich material that this could sort of, you know, feed 10, 50, 20, uh, you know, 100 uh, PhD theses and uh, 1,000 MA theses, <laughs> which we hope that through our various global network and with the help of all of you professors and researchers can take it further, yeah? So uh, with that, maybe we go to the next session. Absolutely, let me share again the PowerPoint. And yes, we are moving to our third and last session uh, about transform tourism to a factor contributing to the SDGs, globally contributing to the SDGs. Um, we said before, and it was also presented in our uh, film, that tourism is often uh, seen, is often perceived as a predatory activity, destabilizing local ecosystems and communities, as well as a global perturbator. But tourism is also a means to promote local and global justice, is a tool to fight poverty and to build peace. Tourism can actively and positively contribute to the SDGs. So this session will present recommendations that will focus on the role uh, of tourism on intercultural understanding, gender equity, and peace. The recommendations that will be presented uh, in this third session will be by Fekri Hassan, French University of Egypt. He will insist on the role tourism can play for peace and justice. Céline Tasté, Paris One Pantheon Sorbonne University, will again take the floor, this time to insist on the role uh, tourism can play for gender equity. Our uh, floor is yours, uh, Fekri. 
Hello, everyone. I'm really delighted to be part of this uh, long, long overdue initiative. Uh, I have been an archaeologist for a very, very long time, uh, having taught uh, both in England and America. My name is Fikri Hassan. And uh, it became very clear to me you know, more than three decades ago that the way to go is to, uh, to deal with the management of uh, our heritage. And now with this initiative, and I really do thank my friends, uh, Maria, and uh, <clears throat> for, for this uh, initiative and for leading this uh, debate. Uh, we already see how, uh, how incredibly rich uh, and informative, many of the different uh, views that we, we have on this issue. None, I think, is far more important than uh, the issue of uh, tourism, peace, and social justice. Um, it may not appear as uh, pertinent or as a priority, uh, given some of the other more uh, uh, pressing issues climate change and so forth, and to poverty, hunger, and so forth. But none of these could be achieved. None of these other, none of the, seven, the other 16 um, SDGs could be achieved if we do not have uh, an overriding uh, approach to peace and social justice through uh, tourism, which we're interested in today. In fact, in the statement on tourism in the 2030 agenda of uh, WTO, um, the issue of extreme poverty, uh, inequality and injustice and climate change have been highlighted as the three most important one in, in their uh, brief introductory statement. In fact, uh, combating inequities and promoting social justice uh, cannot be achieved uh, in a world at war, rife with social conflicts with and between nations. And without this overriding goal, it would not be possible to forge partnerships, for example. Uh, the basis for partnerships uh, would have to be global cooperation, global peace, and uh, global uh, justice. Uh, and this, uh, the, this partnership is one of the main goals, goal 17. And uh, it would not be possible without that as well to uh, deal with gender inequity or uh, uh, inequities in general, goals five and 10. And partnership, partnerships between tourism and other sectors of the economy is therefore, in my opinion, essential for the fulfillment of uh, other goals that are extremely important. Now, given this, and in the light of the current realities, uh, that we are all familiar with or uh, terribly familiar with uh, impacts of uh, globalization, social exclusion, migrations, terrorism, prejudices, poverty, and now, as we all know, epidemics, uh, uh, which brings this issue to the fore. You know, we cannot proceed much further without global partnership uh, toward fighting uh, the epidemics that we now face. Uh, accordingly, I think one of the main objectives in which tourism industry must engage in the struggle to promote peace and to eliminate social injustice. And this has to be done on the basis of adopting and implementing a human right-based ethical tourism. This is the, the main mission, in my opinion. And this can be achieved through an action plan. Uh, this action plan has to uh, be based on uh, some principles, and I will mention some, not necessarily all. Uh, the first one, I think, is equitable, inclusive development. Equitable, inclusive development strategies in the tourism industry and the management of tourist destinations, including World Heritage Sites. This is the equitable, inclusive development strategies are extremely important as a starting point. Second one, is distributive justice, which entails just allocation of resources. The third would be peacemaking through intercultural exchanges, global solidarity, and establishment of meaningful relationships between tourists and host communities. This is an area 
I think is practically possible and essential and can be done in all uh, heritage sites, not just uh, world heritage sites. And the last point that I'll mention today, given the lack of time, is conflict prevention, uh, reconciliation, and con conflict resolution. And we've just heard about one example uh, that highlighted the possibility of this through communication. So I think communication, interpretation, new innovative ways of interpreting and presenting uh, uh, the, the contents of world heritage sites, whether they are on environment or uh, uh, cultural history uh, or social dynamics can be of the utmost importance. And again, I thank Maria and Minja for involving me in this uh, incredibly exciting endeavor. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Fekri. I mean, you're, you're opening an avenue of possible uh, reflections and actions on uh, tourism as a means for social justice. And I'm sure that we will have the time to discuss more about those issues. Yep. Now, I give the floor to uh, Celine Teste, who will speak about also a very important issue, uh, gender equity. Celine. Yeah, thank you again for letting me bring this subject uh, today. Um, so for this part, it concerns some uh, recommendations to transform tourism in a factor contributing to the SDG 5 on achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls, and more especially the point 5.5, which is ensure women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership at all levels in decision making in political, economic and public life. According to the UN analysis, women and girls represent half of the world's population and by therefore half of the potential in economical point of view. However, there is a lack of access to education and employment opportunities for women compared to men in general. Moreover, an average in the world, women in the labor market still earns 24% less than men. Tourism seems to offer better opportunities to women compared to other industries. When we look at statistics from the Global Report on Women in Tourism from the UNTWO uh, 2019, we can observe that 54% uh, of the workforce are women and that the pay gap is smaller than in the average, reaching about 14% um, less than men, which is still too much, of course. But from this perspective, tourism appears to be a source of economical inclusiveness for women. However, women are still not fully participating in the tourism industry because their work can be made invisible, because their skills are less recognized in the job market, because they have unequal opportunities to access leadership positions. This is why in the second axis of our recommendations on tourism and gender equality, we want to propose specific actions to encourage women empowerment. The first recommendation would be, uh, would like, uh, I would like to present in this axis is not new nor revolutionary, but I think is crucial. Uh, this is why I would like to insist and it um, concerns the improvement of women's qualification but de developing special training for them to enter the tourism industry and to access qualified jobs in general, and more especially in World Heritage Sites. This point is raised by the Global Report on Women in Tourism in the key findings. It is said that investment and training for women across the sector in general leads to greater outcome for gender equality. We know that women are underrepresented in certain segments of the industries, for example, in the digital aspects of tourism, as said before. Uh, compared to, uh, for example, hospitality activities. And we would encourage to have a better representation of women in all the sectors of the tourism industry. Furthermore, studies show that women are underrepresented in leadership position in general. Indeed, they mostly represent underqualified workers. This is why we believe that developing special training is essential in order to give them access to more diverse and higher position in the industry. Investing in women's training would lead to more diversity on recruitment and would provide more decent jobs for them. 
We believe this action would be positive improvement for the tourism companies, for institutions and heritage sites, and the whole industry in general. We also made other recommendations on recruitment, and we could find that on Qualtrics, if you want to comment. And then the second recommendation I would like to submit is to work to ensure that women's tourism businesses can become formalized, if they wish to be, of course, and contribute to women's financial inclusion. To achieve this objective, that would mean, for example, to develop uh, individual support and accompaniment for women with tourist projects in World Heritage Sites. This point is important because um, from our field experiences and studies, we can observe that women tend to occupy informal work, often undervalued in monetary terms in heritage sites. They can make crafts, sell souvenirs, prepare and sell food, also be informal guides sometimes. This also means that they often don't appear in statistics. So their participation in the economy is also undervalued. It also means lack of security for them and they can have an uh, unstable and precarious situation because they, don't, they tend not to have contracts. With this recommendation, we would like to encourage the recruitment and employment of women, but also to promote women entrepreneurship, creation of cooperative, and the emergence of women-led initiative in World Heritage Sites. We want to make sure that women are recruited just as men, that tourism companies and businesses give job to women as they do for men, and that they can tackle their own projects. The economic inclusion of women require official recognition of their work. In our studies area, we observe that there are lots of women initiatives in tourism, in heritage site, but they do not have recognized status sometimes. This is the reason why we want to push governments, companies, local communities to recognize and promote women's initiative. We strongly believe that the non-economic inclusion of women is an obstacle to economic and social growth. The SDG 5 shows that the full participation of women in the market of work would increase national growth in many cases. And providing qualified jobs to women can give them the possibility to have representative leadership on heritage sites and contribute to become role models for future generations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Celine, for those very, very rich um, recommendations and absolutely necessary today. I think that we do have uh, interesting questions. So, Minja, yes, uh, yes, we do. But uh, again, <clears throat> I think that, as I mentioned in my opening uh, remarks, you know, I think that once our basic survival needs are met, we all dream of going to nice places with our loved ones, tourism. Tourism is so enriching because it, as many of the uh, uh, comments have been made, it's only really through traveling to see different parts of, of, of the world or within your own country that you know, we develop ourselves. And so, but we certainly don't want to feel guilty about it. You know, we certainly don't want to feel that what we're doing is contributing to climate change and greenhouse emission and to the exploitation of women and whatnot, you know. And, but so in what way, um, Fekri, the question is in what way do you think that, um, uh, that innovative tourism of the kind that you're actually going to be presenting in later sessions on the case study of Egypt but at this point, more generally, in what way can um, we ensure that tourism can really contribute towards social justice and peace? I think we uh, need to rethink um, the content of uh, tourist messages, you know, because it's a communication process. There is always communication going on, but what is the outcome of this kind of communication? It can engender inequality, it can engender conflict, uh, uh, contempt, uh, competition, uh, anger. And I think it can, and, and that's happening nowadays in many cases with tourism. And I think the reverse can be done by opening uh, real genuine channels for exchanging the human experiences between and, and ensuring that uh, the tourist operators or the companies uh, do this along with the 
seeing the nice places or looking at uh, wonderful monuments. Uh, the goal of tourism has to change. I think the mission of tourism, and we are living in a very different time from the time tourism was initiated and through the periods that it has undergone. And I think we need a change in the, in the mission of tourism itself uh, to ensure that it is really based on intercultural exchanges, uh, intercultural exchanges on personal levels, on an experiential level, not just as a, as a people who go as voyeurs uh, to an exotic land and parachute in and out uh, without consideration for the human bond that connects them uh, with the host communities. Uh, lacking this ethic, I think we would be always in trouble. The microphone, Ninja. Ninja. Oh, sorry, sorry. And uh, uh, as you've seen from the chat, especially Celine, I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, comments concerning the, the gender issue. Huh? But uh, mm -hmm. on the more general uh, um, question about leakages of tourism benefits, and in other words, the appropriation and reproduction of tourist products and resetting them to locals to be sold by local communities to tourists. And then the emergence of all of these um, you know, poor products made in mass produce in some corner of the world in large sweatshops. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I myself, every time I go to a World Heritage Site for mission, I go to, of course, the gift shops. But to my utter shock and disappointment, about 80% of the products being sold mm -hmm. in tourism uh, destinations are not made locally, you know? And it's really very sad that, so again, there is a question of government control or whatever, but to what extent can um, uh, the governments uh, control these things? Or is it uh, desirable for them to control things? Because it also uh, undercuts uh, uh, you know, profits for these people who are involved in the tourism uh, in the market, right? So um, again, uh, another very important question is re related to these issues of, of promoting local production of uh, tourism goods, yes. uh, goods for uh, purchased by tourists. It's uh, the, again, the role of the microfinance companies in especially in uh, enhancing the skills of women. It, and I have in my own experience in India, seen that a lot of cooperatives are set up to help women produce things, but there is a fundamental lack of knowledge of how to market them and, mm -hmm. and how to ensure that there's a constant flow of supplies uh, for products that sell. You know, there's a whole question of, of management of these things that are lacking. So what are some of the like the concrete and practical examples can you give Celine on how these uh, aspects can be, um, can be addressed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think it's, uh, uh, especially relevant to my experience in Togo, in, in the north of Togo, where uh, on the World Heritage site, we had a lot of uh, women's cooperative uh, working in different fields. Um, and I think from my experience, the, those micro foundings are very, very welcome, uh, especially um, in uh, places where you don't have a lot of uh, money um, in, uh, in the area, of course. Uh, then it's it's a help to start a project, to start a cooperative. But then that is true that in the long run, you face a lot of difficulties in terms of managing a budget, managing resources. Yeah. So I think um, the point is not to have just punctual and very uh, quick help, but also to have a support, to have long-term support and accompaniment of projects on the long run. And, um, and in order to follow this project and to help them to, to grow, uh, especially. Um, this is something that I've observed can lack on, on the field. Yeah, no, but again, uh, one of the um, questions, it's more like a statement, is that it's important also to identify and address the structural factors, the structural mm -hmm. factors causing women to stay in lower tiers of production and, and not having access to the more higher tiers of uh, administration and financial decisions. And of course, that is not an issue only prevalent in the tourism sector, but everywhere. Mm -hmm. But of course, I mean, as we make our recommendations, we also have to be able to 
make our re recommendations, not just on the theoretical basis, you know, but specifically mm -hmm. targeting to them to different kinds of societies and with different cultures and different, you know, economic and social conditions. I think that's going to be a, a very important challenge. And uh, one comment is that it's not so much that, that the people, uh, that there's a lack of training for women is one of the comment, is that the main mm -hmm. problem is that there just is a lack of awareness of women's cap capabilities and the lack of recognition of their abilities. So again, mm -hmm. that's linked with the issue of structural issues. But, um, you know, it's again, to address any problem, we have to address like multifaceted issues, right? It's of a, of a great mm -hmm. structural uh, problematic. So, um, and a very interesting uh, point, uh, uh, one uh, comment about how tourism and the refugee issue coexist as two parallel worlds in the same space that can be, cons uh, that can be considered as a tourist destination. It's true. In many places, uh, look at all these beautiful Greek islands, uh, Maria. You know, some of my friends are in beautiful resort. Uh, they're having to work uh, in rescue operations of all these refugees who've been flowing in. You know, and the tremendous burden that that causes, which also is re is 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 giving impetus to a complete xenophobic attitude. You know, so I think that these are such important issues that we have to. Um, to, um, to address, uh, because it's not just about uh, favoring tourists with money, you know? Because in my job, I've seen so many reports of uh, tourism strategies. And quite frankly, even before I even open the report, I know that they're going to be uh, recommending, you know, high cost, uh, low impact tourism. You know, there's so many companies making money on this kind of recommendations, which is profoundly undemocratic. So um, I've always in my work pushed for uh, youth hostels. For every single World Heritage Site, there should be an accessible youth hostel, you know, not just for youth, but even for retired people, some accessible things. So we, we have to put all of these issues and also about the growing um, uh, attitude towards foreigners in general in, in our societies, uh, including uh, in the first world. So uh, any last comments on that? Maria, we only have five minutes left, but would you like to uh, maybe conclude and, and, and comment on the take homes from this session to the next session? We just have the time to give the floor now to uh, Sylvia Ouellet, oh, yeah. who accepted to do this very, very difficult, difficult. task yeah. of concluding and uh, trying to wrap up this first the session, which in fact aimed on the opposite, to open up as much as possible. So it's a kind of contradictory task that you are going to do today, Silvia, but uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Minja. And thank you to all the speakers in, in this session and to all the colleagues that have worked on this. So from the first session, and I know it's not easy to do this, but I think that from the first session, there are two main ideas that are key. The first one is that we need a better knowledge on, on tourism. And the second one is that we need this bottom-up approach. So this first idea of that, of the better knowledge of how tourism works, the impacts that it may have on the destination or on heritage sites, and, and how to use this knowledge for better management and for better planning, it's, it's really a need. Carmela mentioned about the use of new technologies and how can they help on, on this better knowledge. But I think that we have still man, many work to, to do and, and have to reflect more on, on what kind of technologies and how can we apply. And this raises a question about ethic as well, because there are many you know, ethical issues related to the use of data, for example, and how can we or how can we should no, uh, work together with companies, for example. The, the second point was uh, referred also by Minja, and it was about the bottom-up approach. In line with the idea of our World Heritage Initiative of the important role of social society, there is an, the need to engage local communities and to engage different stakeholders. You all referred to, to the concept of the limits of accept, acceptable change, but one of the things that have uh, has arised here is that 
uh, tourism ha has different stakeholders in that they are very diverse. So we need to use a multi-stakeholder approach and to consider when we are saying these limits uh, to whom they refer, because we may have different approaches here. And this connects also with uh, Celine's intervention on women, because uh, this multi-stakeholder approach should consider also the role of, of women. And we need more information and more knowledge on, on the role that women may play in heritage sites and tourism, and what can they do and what they are doing. So we need also to work more on, on this knowledge and to find tools to, to know how we are going to work. So the, the second group of recommendations were more about uh, how to assess or, or how to evaluate. And it's important, one of the things, or, or I think the key concept here is that we have to make a shift from a quantitative approach to a more qualitative approach and that we need different methods or to apply new methods to assess tourism as well. So this goes really in line with, with the first issue, which was we need a better knowledge of tourism. It has, been, it has been said here that we need to rethink tourism from a more holistic and global approach. And this goes also in line with, with current trends, for example, in philosophy and economy related to post-neoliberalism economy and the decreasing theories. So it's important to reflect because this is what is happening now. Both speakers, uh, Norberto and, and Zach, refer to, um, to, to the promotion of domestic destinations. We are seeing also that in these pandemic times, many, many destinations, because uh, international borders were, were blocked, they were turning their eyes into, to, into domestic destinations. But uh, we should find tools and ways to, to still keep promoting these, these domestic de destinations. Another concept that was right here was the idea of social responsibility, for example, of, of companies. Uh, Norberto mentioned about uh, different programs, for example, or labeling, but also responsibility of tourists when they make these choices and when they select their destinations. So maybe we should also think about how to raise awareness, awareness of this responsibility that we all have in, in tourism. So we should develop tools to, to better assess as well, not only for companies, but for managers, policymakers, and also for tourists. So we should address different groups. And last but not least, the, the third group of recommendations were about um, peace and justice. We are all aware of, of the huge potential that, that tourism may have in promoting peace and justice. For example, we have different recommendations. Just to mention one, we have the ethic code, for example, for tourism that was promoted by the UNWTO. But uh, uh, we have still many things to, to do and there are many things to be done in, in this field as, as Fekri was mentioning and also, and also Celine. So this idea again of promoting ethic tourism is, is really important. It goes, goes in line, for example, with some of the recommendations in, in the first session. Uh, we have to work more with, with locals, we have to work more with communities, we have to work with companies. So one of the actions should be to identify clearly all the stakeholders and to see how we can work with all the stakeholders and, and try to promote this approach for a more ethic tourism. And of course, this also goes with um, what Celine was mentioning about the empowerment and the leadership of, of women. Minja was referring to uh, addressing the structural factors. And this also goes with, with the first uh, recommendation of Celine. Uh, we have to know why women cannot access, for example, training programs or why it's difficult for them to access uh, um, to, to good jobs opportunity. Because sometimes it's not only about uh, being plans to promote this or not, but there may be also cultural discourses and, and there may be, so this we have to also know and try to identify. So I think that the, the global issue should be that we have to, either, even we have to address the specific recommendations for the different targets and we have to address and we have to find practical recommendations. We have to keep in mind this, this global approach because many of these recommendations have connection, connections between them. So, so we should try to think globally. 
So we also would like to re recommend you to go on Qualtrics and to go through the recommendations. So if you can just give your feedback, uh, they, it will be very welcome. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Sylvia. It was a very, very difficult task, but <laughs> you, uh, I think that you managed to sum up very pertinently the discussions we had uh, today. I think that what seems uh, really important to understand today is that Strangely enough, tourism, opposite to many other activities, is still happening, in fact, with no major planning. And this is not, in fact, the case of, of other um, major economic activities. So it's, it is, in fact, uh, thanks, in a way, we can say this, thanks to the last disruptions that were brought by over-tourism phenomena, in 2017-2018, uh, the local governments understood that they could, in fact, regulate things. And they took, mainly for the first time, very strong measures against this uh, very disruptive phenomena. And it is maybe, again, thanks to the COVID situation uh, and the fact that uh, a lot of states, a lot of local authorities gave a lot of public money, it means a lot of money of taxpayers, that also some other regulations will be more possible today than they used to be in the past. So, which is really, I mean, important to say today is that it is possible to regulate uh, the activities. It is possible to do it systematically and holistically. And it is also uh, necessary to understand that this is absolutely important today, is important for the tourism businesses, is important for the uh, heritage sites, and it is also important for the tourist experience. So. Also, in this, uh, in this sense, a systematic and holistic approach is important. Just to wrap up on the recommendations, uh, you understood that today what we try to do uh, in this first month, as uh, first day of uh, February, is to create a community, a community of researchers, a community of, uh, of businesses, a community of institutions that are interested on this relationship between tourism and heritage. This is the first meeting we had, and we really hope that uh, we will have a lot of opportunities to work during this month and in the months that will follow uh, this 2021 uh, year as a community. So please take the time, visit the site on the um, Our World Heritage Initiative uh, page, enter into the Qualtrics, uh, which is the, uh, the software on which we put all the recommendations and please react. And when I say react, please react. So the idea is to say that if a recommendation seems to you, uh, I don't know, irrelevant, please say it. This is very, very important. It's very important to uh, react really, to bring um, your ideas, to bring good practices, or eventually to express uh, your um, uh, skepticism concerning some of those recommendations. This is the game and we play it as I just presented now. We are open to any criticism to these recommendations. So please play the game uh, this way. Uh, before uh, finishing this um, uh, webinar, I would like to thank all those who made it possible. This is a very collective uh, work and thanks a lot to all those colleagues and uh, uh, and the, the, the teams who really uh, um, allow us, in fact, to organize the recommendations, to prepare the film, to uh, create all of the um, all the technical uh, infrastructure that uh, uh, um, we are inaugurating today, and that you will have the opportunity uh, again to see uh, during the next 26 uh, days.